Most synthetically useful Diels-Alder reactions involve the combination of substituted dienes and dienophiles. These are also more rapid than the parent Diels-Alder reaction with just H's here. One of the important issues concerns the connectivity of the product and the site selectivity or regioselectivity of the reaction. For example, when we combine this diene with an R1 group linked to one of the end carbons with this dienophile with an R2 group linked to the alkene, we can end up with two possible isomeric products, products that are constitutional isomers, or as they're commonly called, regioisomers. In one of the possible products, R1 and R2 end up relatively close to one another in a 1-2 relationship within the cyclohexene product. In the other possible product, R1 and R2 end up in a 1-3 relationship, and this comes from essentially flipping over the dienophile, which results in a linkage between different carbons where the new sigma bonds form to form the cyclohexene ring. In Diels-Alder reactions that occur at a high rate, R1 and R2 are typically electron donating and withdrawing groups, and we can get donating groups in the diene and withdrawing groups in the dienophile, or vice versa. And it's the donating or withdrawing nature of these groups that really dictates the regiochemical outcome. In other words, which constitutional isomer is the major product in Diels-Alder reactions. So we'll return to the idea of donating and withdrawing groups and see how resonance can really help us predict the major product of Diels-Alder reactions in a regiochemistry sense in this video. In the next video, we'll turn our attention to the stereochemical outcome when diastereomers can form. Before we get into site selectivity, though, I did want to make the point that most synthetically useful Diels-Alder reactions that occur at an appreciable rate at kind of normal temperatures occur when we polarize the diene and dienophile through the introduction of donating or withdrawing substituents. So, for example, when we tack on an electron donating substituent to the diene to make it electron rich, and we tack on an electron withdrawing substituent onto the dienophile to make it electron poor, the rate of the Diels-Alder reaction increases dramatically. And most Diels-Alder reactions involve the combination of dienes and dienophiles with substituents of this type on them. So for example, the, the parent Diels-Alder reaction between ethylene and butadiene is relatively slow. This needs high temperatures to proceed at an appreciable rate, something like 300 degrees C. And of course, the product here would just be cyclohexene. That has relatively high activation energy, and we can represent that on a reaction coordinate diagram by drawing the transition state energy for this single step process at a relatively high point. When we start adding donating or withdrawing groups to the diene or dienophile, the rate increases dramatically. And in practice, what that generally means is that we can run the reaction at relatively low temperatures. So something like this, where we've substituted the dienophile with the carbonyl group can occur at a much lower temperature, say 80 degrees C. And an important thing to notice at this point that we'll return to in a second is that this substituent that we've tacked on to the dienophile is an electron withdrawing group. The carbonyl is pulling electron density from the CC double bond. The product in this case is again a cyclohexene, but now it's substituted with a fused five-membered ring involved as well. And so, in addition to going faster, the product has more structural complexity than the parent Diels-Alder reaction, which is a synthetic advantage as well. Finally, let's consider a third reaction where we're using the same dienophile with the electron withdrawing group, but we've tacked on electron donating groups onto the diene. This is the most rapid of the three reactions, and it goes potentially at room temperature. And the product we get now is even more complex in that we have substituents on both sides of the cyclohexene ring. We have the alkoxy substituents on the diene side, and we have that fused five-membered ring still on the dienophile side. Now, these two reactions being more rapid than the parent Diels-Alder reaction means that on a reaction coordinate diagram, we can represent the progress of the elementary step using a lower transition state energy. And so, for example, in the case of the dienophile being electron poor, the second reaction we looked at here, the activation energy is quite a bit lower than the parent Diels-Alder reaction. And when we polarize both the diene and dienophile in opposite ways, using a withdrawing group on the dienophile and donating groups on the diene, we end up with the lowest activation energy of all and a very rapid, intrinsically very rapid, Diels-Alder process. The reason the activation energy goes down has to do with the fact that introducing these groups 
introduces polarization that encourages the reaction to occur. So for example, the inclusion of donating groups in the diene puts partial negative charge on these end carbons of the diene, and, and the inclusion of a withdrawing group in the dienophile makes the dienophile carbons partially positive. And it's the attraction between these positive and negative charges that accelerates the step. Understanding that this is what donating and withdrawing groups are doing will also help us see how to predict the products of diels alder reactions when regiochemical issues come up. So notice that in all three of these examples, either the diene or dienophile is symmetric. So we don't really have a site selectivity or regioselectivity issue. For example, turning over the diene in all three cases will give the same product. On the next slide, we'll look at an example where there is a regiochemical issue. So here now, notice that we have a diene and a dienophile with substituents such that the diene and dienophile are asymmetric with respect to flipping one over. This means we could end up with two possible products. And another way of putting it is that the two carbons on the ends of the diene and dienophile, the carbons that connect through sigma bonds in the reaction, are now different. So for example, this carbon I'm highlighting in black in the diene is not the same as the other end carbon of the diene, which I'll highlight in red. These carbons are now distinct, structurally distinct, because the ethoxy group is operating or is closer to one, we might say, and farther from the other. Similarly, inside the dienophile, the two carbons of the dienophile alkene are now different. This carbon I'm highlighting in blue is relatively far from the carbonyl group, while the carbon highlighted in green is relatively close to the carbonyl group. What this means, now that those carbons are not the same in both reactants, is that we could end up with two possible products via a Diels-Alder reaction. So they will both be cyclohexenes. However, we could end up with a product where we have, again, the fused five-membered ring and the diene kind of linking up in this way with the red carbon connecting to the green carbon and the blue to the black carbon so that the ethoxy substituent has a 1-3 relationship with the carbonyl substituent. Another possible product here would involve flipping over the diene and linking up, for example, the black carbon with the green carbon. That would still contain the five-membered ring. It would still contain a cyclohexene. However, now the ethoxy substituent and the carbonyl substituent have a 1-4 relationship rather than a 1-3 relationship. So let's really quickly highlight the carbons of the diene and dienophile to see how they combine in different ways to generate these two possible products. All right, so now the question becomes, which of these two is the major product? And one of the things to notice right off the bat is that these two possible products are constitutional isomers. This means that we should expect them to have very different properties, and we should expect that one of the two will be the major product. One of the two will predominate over the other. How do we make this prediction? Well, the key is, again, to understand that the donating and withdrawing groups in the diene and dienophile polarize those substrates and create sites of significant positive and negative charge. These oppositely charged sites will tend to bond to one another. To find those sites of opposite charge within the diene and dienophile structures, we can use resonance structures. And this is particularly true when resonance donating and withdrawing groups are present inside the diene and dienophile, which is the norm. By drawing alternative resonance forms of the diene and dienophile, we'll be able to see those carbons where positive and negative charges are located. And these are the carbons that will connect to one another to form the major product of Diels-Alder reactions. And really, a lot of this goes back to recognizing and engaging in resonance electron withdrawing and donating groups. For example, the carbonyl group we know is electron withdrawing. It's a prototypical example of a group that's withdrawing by resonance. That means that in withdrawing electron density from the CC double bond, it opens the door to an alternative resonance form that looks like this. In this alternative resonance form, we have positive charge located on the carbon that we colored blue in the structure above. And that suggests that in the true structure of this dienophile, of course, there is significant partial positive charge located at that position. If you've seen alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyls before, this is the beta carbon of an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone, which has partial positive charge, and the resonance structure illustrates why. The diene contains an alkoxy group, which is a prototypical example of an electron donating group. 
that can engage in resonance with the adjacent diene by pushing electron density towards it such that we can land a pair of electrons on the carbon highlighted in red. And so in the alternative resonance form that's enabled by this electron donating group, we have negative charge sitting on that carbon highlighted in red, which is a CH2 group. I'll go ahead and draw that out in full. And there's positive charge now on the electron donating group, positive charge living on the electron donating oxygen. And the important point here now is that the electron donating group has piled negative charge onto this carbon that we highlighted in red. And again, this means that the true structure of the diene has partial negative charge located at that carbon. These alternative resonance forms have really showed us where the nucleophile and electrophile are in this Diels-Alder reaction. Despite involving cyclic electron flow, we can absolutely think of this reaction as the combination of a nucleophile with an electrophile. To form the major product, the nucleophilic and electrophilic carbons will link up. And so in the original structures, what we can say is that these two carbons, the ones with partial positive and partial negative charge, will link up. And of course, the alternative resonance forms make it very clear why this is the case. These carbons have opposite charges, will be attracted to one another, and that leads to the major product. And so to draw the major product here, what we would have to do is kind of flip over either the diene or dienophile. And so I'll just, it is one of the two products we drew previously, but I'll just redraw it to drive the point home. The carbon highlighted in blue links up with the carbon highlighted in red, which is one carbon away from the ethoxy substituent. So the ethoxy substituent will end up here. The double bond in the new cyclohexene ring will end up here. And the unsubstituted end of the diene will end up adjacent to the carbon highlighted in green. So let's highlight our carbons again. Really the key bond that's made here is between the carbon highlighted in blue, the electrophilic carbon in the dienophile, and the carbon highlighted in red, the nucleophilic carbon in the diene. And probably now you understand why I highlighted those in red and blue originally. The red carbon, electron-rich region, is the nucleophile, and the blue carbon highlighted in blue, electron-deficient region, is the electrophile. This means that kind of by default in the Diels-Alder reaction, the green and black carbons will link up as well. This structure that we just drew is identical to the second product we drew when we were exploring this issue at the outset. So just to summarize here, the key thing to look for when you're trying to decide which regioisomer will be the major product in a Diels-Alder reaction is positive and negative charges on the carbons of the diene and dienophile in alternative resonance forms of those structures. These positive and negative charges are introduced or promoted or injected, we might say, by electron withdrawing and electron donating groups respectively. And it's those specific positions where we see positive and negative charges that will link up in deals all the reactions. Don't be distracted as well by the negative and positive charges that show up on the withdrawing and donating groups themselves, as these are sort of incidental to the Diels-Alder reaction, which occurs within the four-atom and two-atom pi systems that link up to form the cyclohexene ring. 